Welcome to Breakthrough Success. I'm your host, Mark Aberti, the content marketing expert, bringing you five new episodes every week where I and top level guests teach you how to take your business to the next level and achieve your breakthrough. Hello, Breakthrough Success sisters. I just wanted you all to know before the episode actually starts, I've been working a little bit behind the scenes to give you something really special. So a while ago, I wrote my book, Content Marketing Secrets, which helps people create, promote, and optimize their content for growth and revenue. And I just put the finishing touches together to offer that for free to anyone who is interested. So if you want your free copy of Content Marketing Secrets, all you have to do is head over to markgaberti.com slash book. Now, let's jump right into the episode. Well, I don't know about you, but if there's a way to strengthen relationships and get referrals, I am all ears for that. So when I heard about Giftology, I knew that I had to book this guest on my show and um, come up with a bunch of questions, have him share a lot of great insights with you. So we'll be talking about how exactly to strengthen relationships and get referrals for our businesses. So today's guest, a guest, is the founder of the Rulin Group, a gift logistics company that helps clients like the Chicago Cubs, Wells Fargo, Caesars Entertainment, Miami Dolphins, Morgan Stanley, and the John Maxwell Company execute year-round gifting strategies. His unique approach to relationships led him to become the number one salesman for a $250 million direct sales company by the time he was 20. Three, and that's out of the 1.5 million reps who were at that company. He now speaks widely about strategic gifting and relationship building and helps CEOs and sales teams drive referrals and open doors to elusive decision makers. Today's guest for episode 261 of the Breakthrough Success Podcast is none other than John Rulin. John, it is such a pleasure to have you on the show. Mark, I love your energy, man. I'm uh, I'm honored to uh, to be in the 200s on uh, on what sounds like an amazing uh, amazing run that you've had, man. Thanks for having me. Thank you, John. It's such a pleasure to have you on the show. And I mean, I really like the idea behind Giftology. So I'm wondering for people who don't know if you could share a little bit about the philosophy and why you decided to write the book by the same name. Yeah, well, it uh, it wasn't like the master plan that I've had since I was three years old or anything. It's not like I've been like the master gift giver since I was a little boy. I uh, I'm a farm boy at heart. Uh, I was telling you that I, I grew up in Ohio, milking goats on the farm. Um, but uh, as a lot of entrepreneurs uh, start, I started with desperation of wanting to pay for med school. Interned with Cutco, the the knife company that uh, a lot of people are familiar with. Their training is amazing. I was hoping I'd last maybe a, a, a summer if I was lucky. And my life changed because I was dating a girl and her dad was a small attorney. And he was a rainmaker. Like every deal in town came his way. He had more referrals coming out of his ears than he could handle. And he was also radically generous. Like he was always giving away things. He'd find deals on noodles and buy like literally a semi load of noodles for everybody at church the next Sunday, like 200 people. And I'm like, uh, I pitched him the idea of giving away. All of his clients are men. They're in the outdoors. I thought he'd give away pocket knives and uh, maybe Christmas. And he changed my life forever. I mean, he was a small office, maybe five employees. And I uh, said, John, I want to, uh, could I engrave pairing knives and give those out? And I'm like, Paul, why would you give kitchen tools to a bunch of grown men that are CEOs of like million dollar brands or billion dollar brands? That's weird. And he said, John, in, in 40 years in business, the reason I have more referrals and deal flow and I'm the most top of mind person in the entire community is I found that if you take care of the family in business, everything else takes care of itself. So I like my, I like, my eyes rolled back in my head. I was like, holy crap, Paul gets relationship building and reciprocity and these deep principles that are woven into sales and marketing and relationship building at this super deep level. And so I started to use the knives as I'm, I'm, I'm literally 20 years old at the time. And I started buying $200 carving sets, you know, it's a lot of money for a college kid 20 years ago. And I'd grave the CEO name, the spouse's name, family name of like a $200 million company. I'd want to get their attention and I'd package it up in my dorm room. I'd mail it off. And uh, two weeks later, I get a phone call from the assistant. They want to meet with me. I walk into the boardroom. It's like this huge mahogany boardroom. And I'm like 21, you know, at the time. And in walks the 55-year-old CEO. And he's like, I'm confused. Are you the guy that sent me the knives? 
And I'm like, yeah, he's like, you're John Rulin, right? I'm like, yep. He's like, I thought you'd be like 50 years old, like some seasoned sales executive. Like, he's like, I'm confused. Are you here to sell me knives? And I'm like, no, I'm here to help you and your thousand sales reps do exactly what I did to you. So your top 10,000 relationships. And I, I walked out of there with an order for a thousand knife sets of PO and Cutco thought it was fraud. They didn't believe an insurance company would buy a thousand knife sets. They thought I was selling them on eBay or something. And uh, I decided to put med school on hold and started, I basically built a company that helps. Um, and we started calling it giftology then. Cause it was like, what do we call this? And you don't call it like, you know, send knives. Like what, what's the, the principle here. And so we, we started, we started a company, put med school on hold permanently and started to land pro sports teams as clients and solopreneurs. And I mean, we started working with companies of all sizes to essentially use gratitude and gifting as a competitive advantage to drive referrals, to open doors with impossible reach CEOs, to, to turn sale, or turn clients into actual salespeople for you and to, uh, to retain your best talent and your best, uh, your best clients. And so we've never looked back. That was 18 years ago. And uh, we wrote the book about two years ago because people kept begging for it. They're like, just put it like we just need all of our salespeople to read something. We can't can't afford to hire pay you twenty five grand to come keynote. Like, can you just write a book? And finally, we wrote the book, and it's it's uh, it's now starting to go global. It's just been kind of taking a life of its own. It's pretty crazy. And I mean, I find the whole gift giving thing very interesting because it's uh, something different. It's something where you're showing that you very deeply care. Um, about the person you're giving the gift to, but uh, with so many decision makers and so many possible types of gifts that we can give, uh, what kind of gifts should we be giving and who should we be giving the gifts to? Yeah, well, most people get excited and want the catalog from us. Like, hey, what are the gifts I should give? And I'm like, that's the last step. Out of all the steps that we take people through and walk our clients through of the giftology system, the, the actual gift itself is the last step. And I'm like, the who you're giving it to is more important than the what you're giving. Because a lot of times people don't realize, they, don't, they haven't identified, I don't care if you're a solopreneur or whether you're a billion dollar company, who are the most important, like who are the top 10 or 20% of your relationships that are producing all of your deals, all of your referrals, that are all of your media opportunities? Who are the suppliers that you wouldn't have a business without? And people are like, why would you give a gift to your supplier? And I'm like, because I don't have a business without my suppliers. I don't, I don't have a business without my product suppliers and my, you know, print suppliers and people are like, but you're spending millions of dollars with them. And I'm like, yeah, but if they go away, I don't have a business. Like, I'm not going to go make those items. So the who is just as important as the what. Um, you have to identify who you're going to give the gifts to and write them down and have some detailed information on them. Like one of our core principles is don't take care of the who you think is the decision maker, the director of marketing or the CEO, like take care of their inner circle. People are like, what do you mean inner circle? I'm like, the reason the knives work so well and we still sell millions of dollars in knives is that if you take care of somebody's spouse, you take care of somebody's assistant, you take care of somebody's kids or their pets and make them make the executive look like the hero to them. You end up getting the executive in the process. And now you have an internal sales advocate. Like I've literally had clients or prospects that reached out to me and said, John, I thought like your gifting idea was dumb. I wasn't going to do anything with it. Then you start sending me these gifts and, and you included my wife. Now my wife is asking before we go to bed, have you done anything with John lately? Are you going to sit down with him for dinner? He's like, I feel like you're, you have, I'm sleeping with your sales rep. <laughs> and so, so taking care of somebody's inner circle and, and honoring them in a way, not, not in a manipulative way, but just honoring the fact that like for me, I'm married, I got three kids. I'm not, I'm nothing without my wife. Like she's the rock of our family. I'm nothing without, I have like three assistants. I'm nothing without them because they're the ones that actually do all the heavy lifting. And most of the time those people get treated like arm candy or they get treated like pawns or like gatekeepers. They get treated like crap. And so I take, you know, we started out with a thousand dollar a month budget 18 years ago. And now we're up to this year, we'll send out $400,000 in gifts to clients and prospects and suppliers and employees. And so we built up to that over time, three fourths of that budget, like literally $300,000 in that budget is t targeted, not at the executive, but at their inner circle. Cause that's where I can spend a dollar and get $10 back in return. Cause most of the time those people, it's like they get nothing or they get disrespected or they get treated. Like I've had women come up to me 
they're like, John, I've been married to so-and-so for 30 years and they're all blinged out with like half a million dollars in jewelry. And they're like, they're in tears. They're like, John, this is the first time in 30 years anybody ever sent me a gift that had my name spelled right and included me as a human being versus, um, and so what's interesting is like the, who you're giving the gift to is way more important. Yes. The knives are amazing or whatever you're going to send needs to be, you know, world-class and useful and, and meet like all of our criteria. But if you get the who you're giving the gift to, to wrong or you don't include their inner circle or you don't include the handwritten note to go along with it or you throw your logo on it, if you do any of those things, you could take the exact same gift and get a hundred times worse response based upon not taking care of a detail that to us is what we what determines whether or not something becomes an artifact and something that they're raving on social media about or whether they're re-gifting it to – goodwill like one detail wrong and and uh game over you just wasted i don't care if it's five dollars or five thousand dollars on the gift it's uh the little things leading up to the gift are that important and uh like some of the advice i've heard in the past about gift giving is to not do an expensive gift give them something really small like a book or just a handwritten card because you don't want to um like based on the advice i've heard you don't want it to appear like a bribe so I was wondering what your thoughts are on that because you said anywhere from like five dollars to five thousand dollars in previous. Time. Yeah. So our rule of thumb. So most people um, ask themselves. I would say most people that say don't don't do, do do a cheaper gift are either cheap themselves or are playing and playing with fear, which I love because it means I'm going to crush them in the marketplace. And what I mean by that is that most people ask themselves, what's the least I can get away with here? And there's nothing wrong. I send books and I send handwritten notes. Um, but I think that, uh, there's a, there's a sweet spot. That's a hybrid between doing the little, the cheap touch point. Uh, I think a handwritten note that's on really nice paper. Like we spend $9 on our letterhead. It's a sheet of steel. When I send a handwritten note, that's what it goes on. Um, I think a handwritten note is one of the most powerful and underutilized, but most people will write the handwritten notes and they say, thanks. And they talk about themselves for, you know, the entire paragraph. And then they say, you know, they sign their name. So there is a way to write a note that makes somebody feel like, wow, you took 30 minutes to really write something thoughtful in this versus just checking a box, which is how most people write their handwritten notes. Like, I just got to get this out the door. I don't really care what it says. I just need to get a handwritten note done. There's a big difference. The details matter. But I would say the rule of thumb for us is we're not trying to bribe anybody or buy their business, but the same amount of money that you would invest in an experience with them. So dinner round of golf, ball game tickets. Most of our gifts, uh, we call them artifacts because I think most people view gifts as like trinkets and promotional swag and crap like that. That's not a gift. That's a marketing tool. Um, but a gift should cost the same amount that you would invest in dinner out at a nice restaurant with wine or bottle, you know, or, or a golf at a really nice golf course or ball game tickets at a great, you know, at a great professional sports event. So most of our gifts um, are somewhere between $100 and a thousand dollars per gift, so it's not the twenty thousand dollar Louis Vuitton bag or the five thousand dollar watch. Um, in most cases, it's I want somebody to be like, "Wow, this is super useful. This is super thoughtful. Whatever the category is, it's best in class." So I don't send watches to people that wear Rolexes because I'm going to send them a two hundred dollar fossil that's going to end up at Goodwill or regifted or you know never thought of again. Um, but I don't want to go cheap and just say, "Oh." I'm just going to send books to everybody because, you know, most people have a shelf full of books that they've never read. When I send a book like Giftology, we – our first 50 books, that, uh, copies of our book that we did, we spent $200 a piece on them. And people thought we were insane. And the reason we spent $200 is I said this is my 18-year life work. Like if I die tomorrow, my kids hopefully will read this and be like this is what dad represented. He loved on people. He cared about people. Like he thought about people in this way. And I'm like, this is my, this is 18 years worth of blood, sweat, and tears. Why would I try to save a nickel or a dime on a cheaper cover? Or, you know, I'm going to, I want to do the opposite, which is one of our core principles. What's the most I can do? So I'm like, I'm going to create the nicest book on the planet uh, that anybody's ever seen. Spend $200. They were handmade. They were personalized to the 50 relationships that had poured into me, either as a client, as a mentor, as an advisor, or somebody that I admired from afar. So, John Maxwell and Seth Godin and Gary Vaynerchuk and Darren Hardy and Michael Hyatt, huge people. And uh, the covers were personalized with the 
the person's name, their spouse's name, their family name. It said this galley copy handcrafted for so and so. They were then put inside a leather bag, and then they were then inserted in, into a linen box that were all personalized to the person. They're two hundred dollars a piece. We took our nine dollar letterhead on metal and wrote a note saying, "Thank you so much for what you've done. You've impacted me, poured into me, and sent it off." And guys like Michael Hyatt, who get thousands of books sent to them every single year that end up at donated to the library and never read. Michael reached out and said, John, this is the nicest book in 20 years. I used to be a publisher at Thomas Nelson. I was the CEO. I read your book. It's a fantastic. I bought 20 copies for my team. This is the best book presentation I've ever seen. And so everybody that made fun of me for spending $200 on one book, um, I get the last laugh because I, I have people that have thousands of books on their shelves that they've never read before that are now my book jumps to the top of the list. And what's it worth to have a guy like Michael Hyatt or Seth Godin read my book? Uh, most people will pick up a $200 bar tab and not think anything of it. And nobody remembers it a week later. I spent $200 on one book and I have some of the biggest CEOs and thought leaders on the planet talking about my book because – where everybody went cheap, I go 10x, not 2% higher. I go 10,000% higher. And because of that, I do it with gifting too. Most people spend $20 on a gift. I spend $200 on a gift. And I'm not buying anybody or bribing anybody. I'm just showing them that when I say, like, I value your time, I'm putting my money where my mouth is. And most people are just big talkers. And they're not really willing to invest in relationships on the front end and show people that they matter. And when you do that with a gift, something tangible, not as a bribe, there's a sweet spot between cheap trinket and bribe. And we toe the line and show people. And, and that's why companies hire us. They're like, John, I don't know how I have I have 100 people that I really need to take care of. I don't know what to give. They hire us. We do all the gifting for them. But really, all of our principles could be done on your own if you wanted to take the time, energy and effort to go do it. John, that's a really powerful example. And I mean, $200 a piece for a book may seem really expensive, but with all the um, like social proof that you're able to build for the book is uh, really incredible. I'm sure you know that. But um, like you said earlier, that you spend anywhere from three to $400,000, like three hundred dollars to $400,000 a year on gift giving uh, this year. And I'm wondering, how do you balance gift giving with uh, building new relationships and creating content and everything else for your brand. Yeah. Well, I mean, what's interesting is we're, we're spending more money on content and, and, uh, we, I mean, we've hired influencing company, uh, which is a company out of the Midwest here. John Hall is a buddy of mine and, and all of the Inc and Forbes articles. We, I think we've written probably 60 or 70 different articles and, um, you know, we hire people to help, um, you know, manage podcasts and we hire people to help. So I'm all about content, like content for me, you know, if, if, uh, there's other companies out there that if they wanted to get into the gifting business, they, they probably have a bigger budget than I do. But if I dominate on the education and the content and, and if, if, if I'm viewed as, you know, the, the guru or the godfather of gifting, then they have to come collaborate with me on, the thought process and the strategy and the education behind it because they can't duplicate me. So it's not that we don't invest. Like I hired Pete Vargas at Adventure Reach to help us with our stages and platforms and our storytelling on stages. That's why we can charge 25 grand to speak. It's not because I'm a great speaker. I hired the right people to help me, you know, craft things properly. And, and I think content now is more important than ever, but you have to package it properly. And just like a book, you know, like we hired book in a box. It's now scribed to help us with our book. Um, anybody can write a book, um, but are you going to sell any copies and is anybody going to read it? Like that's that's the secret sauce is making sure that you're elevating above the noise. And what most people do is they go into an area that's really competitive and they try to have a pissing match with people that have bigger budgets. And I would rather take an area where everybody goes really, really cheap and go 10 exit and go where everybody goes real expensive and cut the budget out altogether and go redirect that money elsewhere because I don't have the budgets of some of my bigger competitors or people that are out there. But because we're controlling the education and the content side and we're controlling um, the gifting, the tangible, the fulfillment side, we're able to – we're getting people that are reaching out to us that are 100 times our size wanting to collaborate because we've we've changed the dialogue 
in the media. Like we had Fast Company reach out last fall and said, well, John, we Googled gift giving expert and we thought the gift giving expert would be in New York or LA. We can't, we're shocked that they're from, are you from St. Louis? Like you're the gifting expert and you're from St. Louis? Like all the articles keep pointing to you. So they flew me to New York to do a Fast Company video series with one of their journalists to buy a gift for their editor in chief. Um, but it was because we dominated the content side. So it's not one or the other. It's, you know, it's doing whatever you're going to do. Like, I don't have a big social media following on like Instagram because I don't have the resources right now to do that well. And so I just don't do it at all. But when it comes to gifting or content or book writing or whatever, like we go all in and try to do it in a way that nobody else can compete with us. And uh, one of the things that I want to tackle is like, I understand like you're making a very significant amount of revenue. Some people listening to the show right now may only be making uh, like maybe $1,000 each month or $5,000 each month. So they may not have as big of a budget when you account for overhead and things like that. So for someone yep. who may feel a little uh, on a shoestring, how can they get into Giftology? Yeah. Well, I would say that um, everything I'm teaching, I've, I didn't raise any outside capital or venture capital or private equity money, or I don't have a ton of debt. Um, I have one business partner. We're a small team. Like I have 10 employees. I've outsourced a lot of my stuff. I've partnered with my suppliers to give me dedicated staff to be able to play at a Fortune 500 level, but still be a small company. So I started, you know, selling knives to Mr. and Mrs. Jones and bootstrapped and supplied my own money along the way. So I would say that whatever you're doing, whether you're making a thousand, let's say you're making a thousand dollars a month profit. I, our rule of thumb is to reinvest five to 15 percent of net profit back into your relationship. So if you're making a thousand dollars a month, you know, reinvesting a hundred to one hundred fifty dollars back into the one mentor who believed into you or to the one client that you did. Maybe you don't even have that. Maybe you can't even reinvest money right now, which I would I would I would challenge anybody at any size to say you can't reinvest some money because if you can buy if you have beer money and other money to do other things that aren't good for you, then, you know, you can always scrape together money. But let's just say you don't, um, you know, you're taking care of, you know, your 37 cousins and sisters and whatever else that you got to that like, you just don't have any money. The handwritten note, taking the time to write the most thoughtful handwritten note and taking that to that mentor, advisor, client, and reading it to them in person, you both will likely cry and you will deepen that relationship and they will never throw that note away. I guarantee you when they die, it will be in a closet, a drawer, desk drawer somewhere, they will keep that note and you will have deepened your relationship with that person with gratitude in a tangible way and your happiness and that person's happiness will have gone up significantly. It's it, There's been research like statistical data research that been done on that one act alone and anybody, even if, you know, you don't have to spend $9 on your steel letterhead or anything. Like I started out with, you know, $1 business cards early on and bought a hundred of them for a hundred bucks because I wanted every touch point that I had to try to be as different as possible to communicate that the details of gifting and gratitude matter. And so I love talking to people that are just getting started or that are bootstrapping it. Cause guess what? Like, I was the kid in the dorm room bootstrapping it on my own. Like I grew up one of six kids. My, we were poor. Like I wasn't the kid wearing Air Jordans and British Knights back in the 80s. I was the kid wearing hand-me-downs from the garage sale. Um, I didn't have any silver spoon, you know, trust fund to get this started. So it's not that I didn't have, you know, like we weren't poor. Like we didn't have enough money to eat poor. Um, so it's not like a rags to riches story. But we were like lower income. And so what I'd say is that anybody – if you want to commit to this, not don't do it once. Anybody that's going to do it needs to commit to doing it for three years because a lot of the things that we've like, we didn't land the Cubs until after doing gifting for seven years to them. Most people give up after seven minutes. Mm. So you have to be consistent with it and be willing to push through some of the valleys and some of the tough times to be able to get to the other side of things. And so what I'd say is that you'll never regret pouring into your most valuable relationships, whether it's making a thousand dollars a month or whether you're making a hundred thousand dollars a month. It, it um, there's more zeros there, but the percentages of what we recommend from a core value perspective of reinvesting five to fifteen percent of net profits back into people 
that number doesn't change whether you have a $100,000 business or a $100 million business. The numbers stay the same. And I'm really happy you gave that um, percentage, that net percent of what to reinvest into your bit uh, to people because I was going to ask you, like, we have all these different investing opportunities like Facebook ads, Amazon ads, real estate, stocks, and just so many different ways to invest. But that 5 to 15% threshold is a really concrete uh number that we can use for the giftology. So thank you for giving us that number. Yep. Yeah. I, I've seen people invest and get a hundred X return off of their gifts. In fact, somebody from Australia wrote a, a, um, I have no idea who this guy is. He's from, his, I think his name's Nick Clowney. He, uh, he's like, John, I read the book. I, I incorporated, I invested a thousand dollars into a relationship and it's turned into a $137,000 already. Like I've seen, in my own business and in other people's businesses that don't even hire us to do all their gifting where like, you know, Facebook ads, you're hope you're hoping to get a three X return, you know, radio and TV ads, you're hoping to get a, you know, a two X return. Like where else can you get a hundred X return? Mm. A potentially, you know, like not every time, but even a five X or 10 X return. Like in my opinion, the people that win in business long-term, you know, Gary Vaynerchuk talks about playing the long game. The people in business that win the long term have the best relationships. Like where else other than investing in your most important people and relationships are you going to be able to sustain for the long term? To me, there's no other form of advertising or marketing dollars or investment that's going to compare with investing in, in human beings. Even in 2018 with all the tech, people still make the world go round. And if you can invest in the right people and do it consistently, then you're going to have the opportunities to do things that most other people are like, why, how did that, you just get so lucky. I'm like, I don't get lucky. Like I loved on people for 18 years at the level that I could afford to do that. And I've done it consistently. And because of that, um, I'm reaping what I've sown. Like it's a biblical principle of like pouring into people. Like it's not like every single day it works out as a perfect equation, but over the long haul, like you reap what you sow. And, um, and so, yeah, I, I believe passionately about it cause I've seen it and because I've seen it in other people, not just myself. And, um, I like how you mentioned how like the ROI, like I've, it may not be a hundred X all the time, but just for the fact that you're building relationships. And I see this with my own business, like the more time I focus on building relationships, the better things happen for uh, my business. And I'm sure you can see that all across the board with anyone who's successful. They tend to have a lot of healthy relationships behind them. But one of the things that I want to ask, because um, uh, some people, they may not necessarily feel like they're able to embrace giftology. So I'm wondering, what do you believe holds most people back from being able to embrace this philosophy? Um, I would say that um, I, at a core level, it's fear. Like most people tend to follow in our sheep. They want to do what everybody else is doing because it's safe. It's like, you know, they, they give... Um, in the ways that they see other people doing it, they're afraid to be taken advantage of. They're afraid that what if, what if it doesn't work? What if it doesn't come back? So they don't believe that there's, you know, an abundance in the world. They believe in scarcity. Um, and so it's easier to follow somebody else's playbook. And it's, there's no like, you know, MBA class, uh, giftology, you know, at Harvard, even though we've taught at some of the big universities, like two groups of CEOs, like the idea of using gifting and gratitude as a competitive advantage just seems like a weird, warm and fuzzy, like non ROI concept. And I think that most people are wired to, to go, what's the least I can get away with, um, in most areas of their life. And most people struggle if they're honest, especially guys, um, I think women more intuitively get giftology because their emotional intelligence is way higher. But guys in general tend to be linear thinkers, type A, you know, black and white, check the box. And they struggle to even give their spouse a great gift, let alone 100 of their clients or 10 of their clients or five of their employees. So it's a weird foreign concept. It seems like there's no teeth to it. It seems like they could get taken advantage of or look weird. And so most people tend to avoid pain and, uh, or they delegate it to an assistant with some unrealistic expectations say, Hey, we had a good year this year. Here's five grand. And, uh, the assistant's like, well, we have 5,000 clients. We're like, okay, divide 5,000 by 5,000. I guess every, what can you get for a buck? 
Mm-hmm. And that ends up being what the gift that they send. And they wonder why nobody says thank you. And they wonder why, you know, big people are actually not doing business with them. Like people are receiving those things and actually thinking less of them as a human. And so I think um, I tell people all the time, if you're not going to do it right, it is better to do nothing. It is better to stay away from it because a lot of times people are spending money, whether it's hundreds of dollars per year, thousands, millions, they're actually spending money to have a negative consequence. Like people are receiving the thing on the other end and saying, wow, you don't know me at all. Like they're sending gift cards and, and they're like, but it's the thought that counts. And I'm like, no, that's BS. It's it's the thoughtful thought that counts. And you're not willing to put thought into it. So you decided to mail it in and not try and check the box. And you sent gift cards to everybody, not realizing that you just communicated that the other person on the other end doesn't matter. Is that what you wanted to communicate? Probably not. But that's what you communicated to them. So I think that there's risk involved with doing something like this, and most people avoid risk. Um, and so because of that, they either don't do it at all, they do it half, they delegate it, they, they'll, they'll do it reactionary and give gifts after referrals, which is the worst time to give a gift, ironically. Um, and so I think most people don't touch it with a 10-foot pole. And that's a really interesting um, idea where it's not just the thought, it's the thoughtful thought that truly matters. And um, like, I really like the idea where if you're not going to fully commit to it, it's better not to do it at all and just to uh, only get into when you feel like you could commit better. And one of the things I want to ask you is, uh, what is one of the big challenges you face with giftology and this whole philosophy? I mean, I think that, uh, well, first off, like, you know, Amazon and a lot of companies out there can ship stuff. So it's not like we're going to ship things more efficiently than Amazon. So there's a lot of people like, oh, yeah, I do gifts. And they're like, ah, no, you don't. You do promotional items or you do swag or you're shipping a bunch of stuff in a box. That's not giftology. So I think, you know, like getting clear on being able to communicate our message and show people that like there's nobody in our category and that all the details around it matter and that it's worth taking – You know, like some people might, even a small business, maybe they have $20,000 allotted for trade shows and advertising, whatever else. And to get them to to redirect that 20 grand or half of it to, you know, giftology over time, initially it was difficult. People looked at us like we had three heads. Like, you want me to take the money I'm going to spend on trade shows and advertising and marketing and all this other stuff? And instead of sending out 100 gifts, you want me to do 20 gifts? Really nice and handwrite the notes and all of these other things like that's too much work or that seems silly or that I'm not, you know, what if I don't get a return on investment? So initially it took a lot of time, energy, and, you know, like just being repetitive and frequent and mod- eating our own dog food to prove out that this is legitimate. It can be scientifically proven. There's real ROI to this. It can be consistent that there is a system to it and that it can be repeatable. So for a number of years, like there were some times we had some pretty lean years of people looking at us like, you know, like, oh, yeah, like you're still doing the knife thing. You're still building. You're doing the gift thing. Like they looked at us like we were insane. Like, why didn't you go to med school? You got the grades. So I've had plenty of doubters and people looking at me like I was insane um, along the 18 year path. Like it hasn't been all gravy and like this, you know, like hockey stick of growth. It, um, we've taken our lumps. In fact, about 10 years ago, 12 years ago, during the downturn, I had invested in a bunch of other companies and had somebody stealing from me and went through a really dark period with the death in my family and almost lost the business altogether. Um, if it hadn't been for a business partner that, uh, that stepped in and, and, you know, owns half the business, owns all of or half of giftology and everything I touch, um, the business wouldn't have survived. I probably would have went bankrupt. So there's, uh, there's been, it's uh, there's been a rocky road along the the way. It hasn't been all asphalt, that's for sure. And it's interesting you mentioned that challenge because sometimes it could be really good to have that person standing by your side who uh, can help you during bad situations. It's good to have that support group or that one person who you can lean on. Um, so thank you for sharing with us. Like I mean, you also mentioned with the med school and things like that. So obviously, like nothing's gonna be like all nice and easy, but it's good to have the mindset to persist and to continue to persevere through all the challenges that we face. And one of the things that we could do to build our level of commitment, which is really valuable during these challenges, is to 
learn as much as we can. And one of my favorite ways to learn is by reading books. And with that in mind, John, I'm wondering if you could share with us three books that you believe will have a positive impact on us. Yeah. Um, I mean, I'm a man of faith, so I mean, I, I, I always talk about the Bible, but uh, everybody in your audience may not be, uh, you know, directed that way. But that's something I do every every day and, and feel very strongly about. But um, from a business perspective, um, or outside of um, faith based books, uh, give and take was one of my inspired me, and I've incorporated it even into Giftology, the book. Uh, I quoted a couple of different times, but I think it's a fantastic book. Um, I think that uh, um, there's another book that uh, one of my friends and mentors wrote, uh, Top of Mind. Um, John Hall, actually the founder of Influence and Company, and just the power of being top of mind, which I think is just critical. Um, no, no matter the business that you're in, being able to control the dialogue and the content and being top of mind with people. Um, and I would say that uh, an old book that I think really inspired me early on um, by Ken Blanchard, Raving Fans. A lot of people, and, and Tim Ferriss kind of talks about this, that you don't focus on millions of people, like get a tribe of a thousand um, that really believe wholeheartedly in you. And, and I would say it starts with one. Like, you know, I think one raving fan is worth more than 100 satisfied clients. And I think most people focus on get, oh, my clients are satisfied. Like, who cares? A satisfied person does nothing other than maybe sticks with you for now. Like a raving fan not only sticks with you, they likely grow with you and they become a salesperson for you. And I think that one of the reasons that, you know, that we've been able to thrive without having salespeople is we turn through gifting and practicing what we preach, we turn our clients into raving fans for us. And so I think that's a simple one hour read that's really powerful that uh, around the power of having you know, raving fans, not satisfied clients. John, thank you for sharing those great book recommendations. Those will all be in the show notes, marketbird.com slash E261. For anyone interested in learning how to launch, grow, and monetize their podcast, you can also get your copy of Podcast Domination over at markgaberti.com slash PD. And before we wrap up this episode, John, I've asked you several questions throughout our time together, but what do you believe is one question that we need to be asking ourselves more often? I would say that... Uh... Well, I would say one thing is um, what's the, what's the most I can do and, and uh, how can I give more than is reasonable? I think most people hold back in their personal relationships. I think they hold back in their business relationships. They, they're, they're, they, they play fear-based. And I think that when you can give that extra 5 or 10% energy, time, being present, um, like that's where magic happens. And when you can say, like, what's the most I can do and or what's the most I can give here and whatever category that is, not just gifts, but all categories, I think that uh, that's where relationships and, and uh, that's where things flourish versus stay stale. John, thanks for sharing with us that great question. All of your great insights throughout our time together. Uh, if you guys want to learn more about John, I strongly recommend you get his book, Giftology, which will be in the show notes. I mean, if you've liked what we've, you've heard from this episode, just think Giftology, his book goes a lot more into detail based on some of the things that we covered in this episode. But I can't thank you enough for John for coming on the show and sharing all of your great insights with us. Thank you for being on Breakthrough Success. Yeah, well, if it's if it's relevant, is it possible to give your tribe or audience a gift? Would that be oh, since I'm the Giftology it. guy? Yes. Um, so a lot of times people will talk about like, Hey, what are the top 10 best things to give as gifts? They want to pick my brain, which I hate that term. Like don't ask anybody to pick their brain. Cause that basically says, I want your best information for free. Um, which is not a great way to value somebody that you respects time. But, um, I think one of the most powerful things that we take our clients through is a series of exercises talking about the worst gifts to avoid giving and why like even our fortune 500 clients, we take them through this exercise and gift cards are on that. Uh, worst gifts to avoid giving. If, if people would just avoid these 10 things and gifts, they would be better than 95% of their their peers or even Fortune 500 companies. So if you want to dominate and not even have to buy Giftology, um, these 10 gifts, you can download the free white paper and PDF um, at The Giver's Edge, thegiversedge.com and, and um, walk through your team or your marketing person or your outsourced assistant 
and uh, we give real practical info on that one pager of, of, um, of things to stay away from and why. And uh, real simple framework, but I think super powerful when you're thinking about if you're going to incorporate this kind of plan into your your uh, your program. It's uh, it's a it's a powerful resource. John, thanks for sharing that great gift with us. Following the giftology philosophy, uh, do what you teach. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> uh, <laughs> Uh, so just thank you again for giving us that gift, which will be in the show notes and for coming out breakthrough success. Hey, thanks for having me, Mark. How does over 100 retweets per day sound to you? My free ebook, 27 ways to get more retweets on Twitter has you covered. I use the methods within this ebook to get over 10,000 retweets every single quarter to learn.